From the very first moment that I saw the new Catan Shard of the Void Dragon model, I knew exactly how I wanted to paint him. I recently finished watching Watchmen for the umpteenth time and couldn't help but see the muscular human form of the Void Dragon in a bright blue. I'm Pete the Wargamer and in this video I'll be showing you how to paint the Catan Shard of the Void Dragon like Dr. Manhattan. I began by assembling the model as per the instructions, however to make painting process much simpler for myself, I decided to keep a number of the parts separated. I kept the spine and tail section along with the wings separate from the body. In addition to this, I also didn't attach the main body to the base. To help me hold these parts during painting, I drilled small holes into the more discrete parts of each component and superglued a length of 1mm thick wire into them to make a little easier to grip handle. The base was mostly pre-sculpted, but I needed to help blend the raised parts of the base into the flatter parts. For this, I used some of the texture gel from Vallejo. This is super easy to apply and just requires a large brush. Once I'd helped to blend the sculpted part into the rest of the base, I just needed to leave it to dry for a few hours and then I could prime it. The primer I chose for this was a black primer. It might seem like an odd choice for such a bright finish, but I wanted to make some of the darker shadows to help boost the contrast between the raised and the recessed parts. I'm using some of Vallejo's black surface primer in my airbrush, along with an equal amount of airbrush thinner. This was mixed together and steadily applied to the model's surface. After applying the first layer, I allowed it to dry before hitting it again. The result was a really thin primed surface that wasn't obscuring any details whilst giving me an excellent surface texture for my later layers to be applied to. I began the painting process by focusing on areas that I wouldn't mind overspilling onto with a blue chlorine later on, such as the floating rocks and the base. I grabbed myself some airbrush thinner and mixed some corn red into the airbrush reservoir to create a thinned mixture. I wanted a colour that would both fit in with the Dr. Manhattan theme, but also contrast nicely against the blue. Ultimately, I chose to represent the red oxide surface of Mars. Reds and oranges sit opposite the blues on the colour wheel, so they will contrast brilliantly. Using the thin mixture of my airbrush, I began to slowly apply the corn red over the black base coat. I targeted my application mainly from above to help represent how light would naturally fall. The result is a lighter red at the top of the rocks and darker points underneath to represent shadows. I applied several thin layers here, steadily building up the paint until the very tops of the rocks were pure corn red. In addition to painting the rocks on the base, I also applied this and the following steps to the stone detailing on the Void Dragon's crown and wings too. To help bring out the details and to further enhance the gradient effect of the previous step, I next began to dry brush the rocks with some squig orange. To dry brush, I took a larger brush and dipped it into my paint before wiping away the excess onto a piece of tissue or you could use a piece of paper. This also helped to work the paint more evenly through the bristles. So once the brush was prepped, I could next start to apply some light but quick brush strokes over the rocks. The combination of this brushing action and the small amount of paint left in the bristles caused the paint to only accumulate onto the raised edges and details of the rocks. In a similar manner to the previous step, I continued to focus on the upper parts of the rocks to build up that appearance of light and shadow. With the same dry brushing technique as before, I applied the lighter orange of Luganoth orange. This time around, the application was restricted to all but the most prominent details, the highest points of the rocks. This really helped to emphasize those particular details. At this point, the red of the rocks was completed. However, I felt that some of the cracks and other recesses weren't quite dark enough to give a realistic shadow. Therefore, I turned to the ever trusty Norm Oil Wash. But instead of applying this wash over everything, I instead took a fine-tipped brush and directly applied it into the recesses. By directly targeting these areas, I ensured that once the wash had dried, that only these areas would be darkened down. In turn, this would further boost the contrast between the lighter and darker points of the rocks and help to add some depth of detail to them. With the rocks completed, I was able to move on to painting the body of the Void Dragon. I wanted to recreate that glowing blue effect of Dr. Manhattan, but needed to steadily build up the brightness of the blue, keeping the darker points in the recesses to maintain definition. So 
I started with some staggered on scale green through my airbrush, thinned in the same way as the corn red I'd used earlier. Like before, I ensured that the upper parts of the model were covered more completely than those that were underneath. This began the slow and steady build-up of the dark to light gradient that I was looking to achieve here. To help smooth out the transitions as I moved from the darker to the lighter paints, I decided to create a mixture of staggered on scale green that I used in the previous step with some of the brighter Temple Guard blue. The result was a shade that lay between the two paints. This mixture was then applied over the body. This time I started to be a little more focused with my application, trying to use my airbrush to pick out only the more raised parts of the musculature and keeping the recessed parts darker. Following on from the previous step, I was next able to apply some pure Temple Guard Blue through my airbrush to continue the transitions of shade. I narrowed my focus once again here, covering slightly less area than I did before and focusing the application to the upper parts of the model. For this next step, the application needed to be much more targeted than I could comfortably achieve with the airbrush. So I switched to my regular brush and palette. I began by creating a mixture of Temple Guard Blue and the even brighter Baharoth Blue to once again create a mid-tone between the two paints. To this, I added some Lamium Medium to help thin out the mixture slightly, creating more of a glaze. This was then carefully applied to the same areas as the last few steps, but again, I more tightly focused the application so that it continued to develop that gradient. Now that I had successfully achieved the gradients in the blue, I wanted to start to pick out the edges of the details with some Baharoth Blue and an Edge Highlight. Edge highlighting has a similar result to the dry brushing, but it is much more focused. For this step, I used a fine tipped brush and carefully dragged it along the sharper edges of the model, leaving a thin line of paint behind. This was applied over all the sharper edges of the torso, such as the more defined muscles, the disintegrating squares around the torso, and also to the spear. Following the same highlighting principle as before, I wanted an even brighter paint, so mixed in some white scar into my Baharoth blue. This bright blue was then carefully dotted to the corners where two edges intersect, in what I like to call an extreme highlight. This helped to really emphasize these details, and once done, left me with the finished blue glow of the torso. After completing the Void Dragon's body, I next turned my focus onto the metallics on the miniature. Even with the red oxide rocks, the cooler blues of the model were still going to dominate this miniature, so I needed a warm metallic, something that would complement the blue. I ultimately opted for Rune Lord Brass and painted over the metallic areas of the model, such as the large scarab, the wings, and the crown. To help maintain the warmer tones of the Rune Lord Brass, as well as giving it a little more definition, I chose to apply a wash of Cryptek Armor Shade. I did find that straight out of the pot, it was a little too strong, so I thinned it out with a little airbrush thinner first. The final step for the metallic areas was a highlight. Canoptech Alloy has a similar hue to the Rune Lord Brash, but it is brighter, and so was the perfect choice for an edge highlight. I carefully lined all the edges of the metallic areas with this paint before thoroughly cleaning my brushes and changing my paint water. This was done to prevent cross-contamination of metal flakes into the next steps. At this point, the only remaining areas to paint were the crackling bolts of energy that held the Void Dragon aloft. I wanted these to be blue also, but they needed to be a slightly different tone to help better differentiate them against the body. However, as these areas were still quite dark due to the black primer, I ideally needed to use a base paint which are more heavily pigmented. As no base paint of sufficiently light blue colour existed in the Citadel range, I decided to make my own by mixing some grey sear in with a little of the contrast paint Ethermatic Blue, along with a little thinner. With the paint mixed, I was able to tackle all the bolts of energy as well as the various pipes and glowing orbs on the scarab. After the grey sear and Ethermatic Blue mixture had been applied, I was left with a good blue-grey starting colour. I wanted to boost the blue of these bolts further, so I applied a mixture of ethematic blue, thinned out with a little airbrush thinner to create a thin glaze. When applied over the bolts, it gave them a stronger blue colour whilst also helping to create a little definition in the slight peaks and troughs. To further boost the level of detail, I then set about applying a fine highlight of pure white scar over the aforementioned white peaks. <laughs> 
Finally, I need to create the appearance of object source lighting, and the quickest way to do this was with my airbrush once again. I added some temple guard blue and some thinner in the same way as I had done earlier, and carefully sprayed the areas around the bolts where they connected to the ground or to a rock. I built this up slowly to create a gradient, applying less and less paint the further away from the contact point. This helped to create the fall off of light. The final step in the painting process was to clean up the rim of the base. The overspray from the airbrushing and the dry brushing meant that the sides were not a single uniform color and so looked a little bit messy. This was easily resolved by applying a layer of Abaddon Black all the way around. At this point, I was left with a fully painted but unassembled model. I need to finish construction, but before I began to manhandle the model, I wanted to ensure that the paintwork was protected. So I first applied some varnish. I used some of AK Interactive's Ultra Matte Varnish here through my airbrush. It created an extremely matte finish, which while it's not for everyone, I personally really like the effect. Using this varnish, I applied a couple of thin coats, allowing it to dry between applications. The result was a better protected paint scheme with some of the glossier specs removed. To assemble the model, I needed to first remove the wires and clean up the contact points, the areas that the two components were joined together. The wires just needed to be twisted and pulled out, but to remove the paint on those contact points, I carefully scraped it away with my knife. I made a few comparisons between the parts to ensure that I wasn't removing too much or too little. I wanted as much clean surface area as possible. This ensures that I get the strongest bonds when I apply the glue. With everything cleaned up, I bought in my super glue, and I could have used some plastic glue here, but my super glue is more of a gel and is so less likely to run and damage the surrounding paintwork. But take particular care with this step to ensure that the glue doesn't accidentally get anywhere it shouldn't. And with that, my Dr. Manhattan inspired Shard of the Void Dragon was completed. Overall, I am really pleased with the result. I think the combination of the cooler blues and the warmer reds and brass coloration works really well and helps bring out that glowing blue that I wanted to achieve. Surprisingly, the model was also fairly straightforward to paint. There weren't too many fiddly details to contend with and the sub-assemblies and airbrushing helped out greatly. However, I'm not too happy with the sphere. After seeing everything together, I think it blends in a little too much to the blue of the body, and I feel that using some bronze, like on the metal areas, would have helped with this. And so that concludes the Shard of the Void Dragon painting guide. I do hope you enjoyed it, and also learned a little from it too. You can find a full list of all the paints that I've used in this guide in the description below. As always, I just want to say a big thank you to all of my supporters, the people who support me on Buy Me A Coffee and on Patreon, and also everyone who uses my affiliate links. If you would also like to help me out in making these videos, I have some affiliates links in the description and you can also support me on Buy Me A Coffee as a one-off or as an ongoing membership and all the links to those are in the description below. And so all that's left to say is, until next time, thanks for watching and goodbye.